Hello everyone. I hope you are doing well. Over the past two and a half years, I have introduced many topics about internal martial arts and Xiu Dao. Well, we have talked about quite a few topics which were relevant to more than one internal martial art, and also some concepts like Dan Tian, which were explained in the context of uh, the internal martial arts as well as Xiu Dao. So far, there has been little to no discussion on the interrelationships between the internal styles and the Xiu Dao. Speaking from observation over the decades, there are many misunderstandings and misrepresentations of uh, these two practices in the community. So, in today's video, I will focus on the relationship between internal martial arts and the Xiu Dao practice, and also explain how to handle the practical aspects of each practice. But first, let's get high on tea. This week's tea is Hong Wulong or Red Wulong tea. Hong means red, Wulong means Wulong tea. A very popular tea around the world. Traditionally, there are four types of oolong teas based on geographical origins. First type, Minnan or Southern Fujian Province. Famous tea such as Tie Guan Yin or Iron Goddess is from here. Second, Minbei or Northern Fujian Province. Famous tea such as Da Hong Pao or Big Red Rob from Wuyi Mountain is from here. Third, Guangdong. Famous tea such as Feng Huang Dan Cong or Phoenix Single Bush. And fourth, Taiwan. Famous tea such as Dong Fang Mei Ren or Oriental Beauty Tea is from here. Taiwan Oolong Tea actually originated in Fujian province. But over the last 200 years, Wulong tea in Taiwan has further developed the most varieties. Also, another popular method to categorize Wulong tea is the fermentation level, ranging from a lightly fermented tea at 10%. To heavily fermented tea at 90%. Different processing methods, especially the different levels of fermentation, have led to the creation of different tea flavors, resulting in oolong tea becoming a huge category of tea in the market. So, what is red oolong or hong oolong? Well, it is a heavily fermented oolong tea from Taiwan, which has undergone some red tea processing methods. Hong oolong is still an oolong tea and not a red tea since its production mainly involves processing methods conforming to the oolong tea standards, with some added red tea processing methods. So, Hong Wulong possesses a unique flavor which is the combination of the strong flavor of Wulong tea and the soft sweet flavor of red tea. Hong Wulong has been enjoying increased popularity ever since its introduction about 25 years ago in Taiwan. The high fermentation level of this tea at about 80 to 90 percent, combined with the red tea processing method, gives the tea decoction a red color. The soft, sweet flavor of this tea is on account of the red tea processing method. Since the Taidong area, the birthplace of this tea used to produce red tea in history. Tea leaf is picked from the big leaf species tree and harvested in the later summer and the fall seasons. 
The Wulong Precising Method makes the tea stronger in flavor and can last for multiple brews. Some Hong Wulong brands even use the same tea leaf used to produce Oriental Beauty Tea, which is beaten by Jacobasica for Mansana or the tea jacid. So, some types of red oolong tea possesses a unique honey flavor. If you would like to know more about the unique processing involving the tea jacid, Check out my video titled Monthly Q&A 24, in which I have introduced the famous Oriental Beauty Tea or Dongfang Mei Ren. The link is in the description. I have a couple of boxes of Hong Wulong tea. I remember my first experience with this tea like it was yesterday. It has a mix of honey, sweet, fruity, floral flavors such as orchids, and a cool flavor such as mint. Taiwan Oolong tea manufacturers frequently invent new Oolong teas which is great. This is the typical tea leaf. This is the tea decoction. Nice color and strong flavor. One of my favorite. Hong Wulong is best brewed with water at 95 degrees Celsius or higher for 15 seconds. Other brewing methods such as a longer brewing time or even cold water brewed red Wulong tea are becoming more and more popular these days. I prefer the traditional brewing method high water temperature and short brewing time. Do let me know your experience with Hong Wulong in the comments. By the way, many areas including some provinces of mainland China began producing this tea some years ago. Luye of Taiwan is still the place that produces the best red Wulong tea. I hope you will enjoy this wonderful tea. Now, Let's move on to today's main topic. Topics covered in today's video include first, ultimate goal of Xiu Dao, second, from martial art practice to self cultivation, third, Xiu Dao versus internal martial arts, key differences, fourth, Xiu Dao and internal martial arts, integration, fifth, Misperceptions, sixth demonstration, and seventh takeaways. So, without any further ado, let's get started. Topic 1 Ultimate Goal of Xiu Dao. As mentioned in prior videos, there are two categories of Taoism practices Dao Jiao and Dao Jia or religious and philosophical Taoism, with major differences between them. First, philosophical Taoism is the school of thought, while religious Taoism is the religious group. Second, philosophical Taoism emphasizes self-cultivation, non-action, and following nature, while Religious Taoism focuses on the pursuit of immortality. Third, philosophical Taoism is largely either atheistic or agnostic, while religious Taoism is Gnostic. Very often, religious Taoism refuses to accept the separation between religious Taoism and philosophical Taoism, with their justification that Taoism should be a whole instead of parts. Looking at history, philosophical Taoism came into existence much earlier than religious Taoism, and the lack of a belief, if not a total refusal of the Taoist divine system, but the belief and the practice of a Taoist philosophy, has existed 
for thousands of years. That's why I personally support the separation of uh, philosophical and uh, religious Taoism. Based on the two types of uh, Taoist practice, the ultimate goal of a Xiu Dao practice for each of them is different. As mentioned in many prior videos, the ultimate goal of a religious Xiu Dao is immortality or becoming a celestial being. According to religious Xiu Dao, immortals can possess not only divine power but also solutions to worldly problems. At the same time, philosophical Xiu Dao has different objectives even though some practitioners share the same objectives as the religious one. Throughout history, philosophical Xiu Dao practitioners have pursued the goal of a happy life through self-cultivation. Especially in the last few centuries, the latter has been becoming more and more popular. Furthermore, the concept of immortality has also acquired some new meanings in the physical, psychological, and spiritual context in the last century, thus leading to further enrichment of the concept. I believe that philosophical Taoism practice will keep developing with time and will get integrated into our daily lives at a deeper level. The practice of philosophical Taoism does not require you forsake your practice of any religion. So, anyone can practice philosophical Taoism without believing in Taoist gods. Over the millennia up to the present day, Xiu Dao has been practiced by a vast number of practitioners and is an important part of Chinese energetic and spiritual practice. At the same time, the Chinese internal styles of martial art and evolution of martial art practice have also benefited many practitioners. Furthermore, the integration of Xiu Dao with martial art practice has been a very interesting idea in history. So, when and how did the Xiu Dao practice become part of the internal styles of martial art practice? That brings us to the next topic. Topic 2 From martial art practice to self cultivation. As mentioned in prior videos, Chinese martial art practice is rooted in ancient Chinese military training. Furthermore, the internal style of martial art practice started emerging a little over 400 years ago. With centuries of development, it became the most popular and effective style in the Chinese martial art community for about 150 years. Then, around the beginning of the 20th century, martial art practice, especially the internal styles, gradually changed its training purposes and methods from pure military battle to civilian practice due to political, social, and economic development. For example, in the 1920s, martial art practice was promoted as a way to strengthen and unify the Chinese national spirit. So, the function and the value of martial art training had evolved greatly. In the process of shifting from military to civilian practice, many internal style practitioners adopted Xiu Dao concepts to introduce its training benefits. For example, Sun Lu Tang and Xue Dian, among many others, emphasized the concept of Yi Wu Ru Dao, or entering the Dao through martial art practice. Since then, 
the prior dominant pseudo practice with added martial art components transformed into a more dominant martial art practice with added pseudo components. A totally new phenomenon. In other words, martial art training, especially the internal styles, started integrating the ancient physical training for military soldiers with either religious or philosophical Taoist concepts. It was a new development and this approach became very popular soon after its introduction to the community. As a result, the basic function of a martial training changed from battlefield survival to martial art practice for self-defense and physical fitness, in addition to other benefits introduced by Xiu Dao practice. Eventually, it became a means for self-cultivation instead of being limited to a fighting skill. The benefits of practicing martial arts have been enriched depending on an individual's training purposes. In other words, you can focus on its martial aspect while some focus on its health benefits as well. Martial training became a practice for self-cultivation which was not a decrease in its function but, on the contrary, an improvement of its function. However, understanding the brief history without understanding the practical aspects and the differences between each system is effectively useless in guiding practice. In other words, is it sufficient to expect the result of entering the Tao through mere martial art practice? Can it be done so easily as it's priced by the term itself? To answer this question, we have to know what they are first, especially the differences between them. So, what are the key differences between martial art and Xiu Dao practice? That brings us to the next topic. Topic 3 Xiu Dao vs. Internal Martial Arts Key Differences Xiu Dao can be broadly described as any energetic practice in Chinese history, but in order to make a head to head comparison, I'd like to use the typical Xiu Dao practice, the internal elixir practice or Nei Dan, as an example since many of the terms borrowed by internal martial arts back in the 1920s were actually Nei Dan terms. So, what is the fundamental difference between internal martial art and Xiu Dao practice? Besides many other differences, Technically, internal martial art practice applies a dynamic and outward approach, while Xiu Dao practice applies a static and inward approach. Let me explain. Internal martial arts, regardless of the term internal, is still a physical training system intended for self defense purposes no matter what the main objective of the individual practitioner is. Any movement, even a soft and a slow motion Tai Chi practice for health is still intended physically outward. This outward intention becomes more obvious when practicing the arts for self-defense. So, the overall energy flow experience gained in martial art training is intended to improve physical strength, energy exchange, and eventually can be used in self defense situations. Some styles, such as Xing Yi and Chen Style Tai Chi, contain many fast and intense movements 
in terms of uh, speed and uh, power release, which actually consume a great deal of energy during training. On the other hand, Xiu Dao is an energetic practice that mainly focuses on cultivating and refining energy, which is an inward approach in stark contrast to the outward approach used in martial arts training. As mentioned in prior videos, Xiu Dao practice is a purely energetic practice system, while martial art training at the most only borrows some Xiu Dao elements in terms of energy cultivation and refinement practice. More importantly, the benefits of Xiu Dao practice and the martial art training are mutually exclusive but not mutually conflicting. At higher levels, they can actually integrate it into one. In other words, practitioners should understand the different technical aspects of each practice and apply them according to their objectives. Conflating one practice with the other will only lead the practitioner astray. That is why it's imperative for a practitioner to be well aware of the differences between the two practices, which is the primary motivation behind today's video. Of course, there are many other differences between the internal martial arts and the Xiu Dao practices, but the dynamic and outward approach versus the static and the inward approach is the essential differentiator between them. I have to say that all other differences build upon these key primary differences. So, understanding the different approaches used by each practice is the prerequisite to a correct practice. Having established the different in approach, how do you integrate them together? That brings us to the next topic. Topic 4. Xiu Dao and Martial Arts Integration Comprehensive integration of Xiu Dao and internal martial arts is the holy grail of internal practice. Unfortunately, none of the prior training documents in history have shed light on this topic. For example, Documents written by Sun Lu Tang, Xue Dian, and others only used some Xiu Dao terms instead of providing any explicit, actionable information. Of course, it was not a mistake since, as explained earlier, this concept was first introduced as part of the training path only about 100 years ago. There was only some description of such an approach in prior documents without any clear explanation. I recommend practitioners study both practice separately in order to achieve an advanced level that integrates the benefits of both Xiu Dao and internal martial arts. In other words, a practitioner should first aim to possess basic knowledge of each practice and then practice each system individually without any conflation between the two. For example, martial art training should involve focusing on its physical aspects with gradual progression toward the energetic aspects such as energy sensation, energy awareness, and so on. At the same time, Xiu Dao practice should involve focusing on the energy refinement process with gradual progression towards focusing on its impact on physical aspects. At each stage, the focus on each aspect should be handled correctly so that a better training outcome will be achieved. The next step is to intentionally apply experienced energy practice from Xiu Dao to the internal martial art training and conversely, 
convert and refine the energetic experience achieved in martial arts training into Xiu Dao practice. For example, you can always follow up on your martial arts training section with a brief Xiu Dao section but never the other way around. Remember, Xiu Dao training is always practiced after martial arts training in a session, not the other way around, or the benefit will not be as expected. At the next level, you should focus on natural integration instead of proactive integration as introduced in the previous step. It may sound counterintuitive, but this natural integration takes a lot of effort and requires a much longer time for mastery, but the benefits of this approach are surely worthwhile. In summary, so far I have briefly introduced the approach to integrating both Xiu Dao and the internal martial arts training as one. It is only a short introduction, but the fundamental concept has been established and explained. The higher levels of integration need some elaboration which I will talk about in the future, but the explanation of the first step should help to get most of you started. So, let me know how this approach works for your practice. With that, let's now clarify some common misunderstandings of this concept in the next topic. Topic 5. Misperceptions An elegant concept of integrating Xiu Dao and the internal martial arts practice cannot provide any meaningful benefit without a clear practical solution. It is important to understand the impossibility of achieving the Xiu Dao result by only practicing internal martial art without actually practicing Xiu Dao. For example, some people believe that as long as they focus on the internal aspect of internal martial art practice, they will be able to practice Xiu Dao simultaneously. This is a huge misperception and I'd like to debunk today. First of all, the so-called internal aspect of internal martial art practice in pursuing the same benefits and experiences of Xiu Dao are not clear to begin with. In other words, the primary questions that need to be answered are first, what are the internal aspects? Second, are they merely some visualization exercise or breathing techniques? Until you clearly define these terms, any practice to achieve the result is just an illusion, which violates the concept of a Taoist practice. Secondly, can mere visualization or breathing techniques used in internal martial art practice provide the same result as a Xiu Dao practice? Well, they are definitely not enough, since practice based on an outward approach cannot provide the benefits of an inward practice such as Xiu Dao. The fundamental differences between Xiu Dao and the martial art practice make it impossible to achieve the same result. Any specific achievement of a practice should be based on a specific method, or else it would be speculation at most. Third, those who practice Tai Chi in slow motion with inward visualization practice aim to achieve the same energetic experience of Xiu Dao, but they will not achieve it. No matter how slow your Tai Chi movement is, it is still a dynamic and outward oriented approach, which is the total opposite of the approach used in Xiu Dao practice. So, no matter how slow your Tai Chi practice may be, you can never reverse the approach. In other words, Tai Chi practice 
can never be a substitute for Xiu Dao practice. To summarize, many practitioners conflict Xiu Dao and the internal martial arts practice. That should be avoided if your objective is to achieve the full benefits of any practice. Topic 6 Demonstration In today's video, I'd like to demonstrate a Xiang Xing Shu exercise since Xue Dian emphasized the concept of Yi Wu Ru Dao or entering the Dao with martial art practice. Topic 7 Takeaways First, different categories of Taoism, such as philosophical and religious Taoism, aim at different goals, ranging from immortality to enjoying a happy and healthy life. Second, from a martial art practice to self cultivation. Perceiving martial art training as a way for self cultivation was the result of a political, social, and economic development that started about a century ago and still keep developing even today. Third, internal martial arts, regardless of the term internal, is still a physical training system intended for self defense purposes. No matter what the main objective of the individual practitioner is, Xiu Dao is an energetic practice that mainly focuses on cultivating and refining energy, which is an inward approach in stark contrast to the outward approach used in martial arts training. Fourth, comprehensive integration of Xiu Dao and internal martial art is the holy grail of internal practice. I recommend practitioners study both practices separately in order to achieve an advanced level that integrates the benefits of both Xiu Dao and internal martial arts. Fifth, some people believe that as long as they focus on the internal aspects of internal martial arts practice, they will be able to practice Xiu Dao simultaneously. Remember, this is the huge misperception. You should practice martial art and Xiu Dao separately first and make gradual progress towards a natural integration of the benefits of both. That brings us to the end of today's video. Thanks for watching. See you next time and enjoy your practice.